Uh, yeah. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first uh, evening talk of the series for 2022 from the Keele Physics Lecture Centre. Um, firstly, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I appreciate that it's been a, a difficult period for the last few months, certainly for the last year or so. And it's great to see so many people signed up to join us this evening. I think we've got over 60 people in this virtual room. So thank you. Uh, very quickly, because I don't, you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from our speaker tonight, which I'll very briefly introduce in a moment. But for those that haven't joined us before, uh, my name's Scott. I'm a member of the, uh, the Keele Physics Centre, which is part of the uh, West Midlands branch of the Institute of Physics. Um, for those that have visited Keele before, it's a lovely quaint uh, campus university up in North Staffordshire. One day we may, may get back to in-person talks. I'd love to welcome you to our uh, physics department. But in the meantime, uh, the beauty of our virtual talks means we can um, have guests such as uh, Dr. Sartoria this evening coming all the way from Brazil, which is something we certainly wouldn't be able to do um, in North Staffordshire. So just a couple of quick <clears throat> housekeeping uh, bits and pieces. So I've, I've given you the welcome. You will see, um, hopefully on your screens, we have uh, the excellent skills of Stephen, our British Sign Language interpreter this evening. Stephen has very kindly joined us for all our talks in this talk series. Um, and it's, it's part of our endeavour as a branch to make our content more equitable and accessible to a broader audience. So uh, for those that require it, please do use Stephen um, to help interpret this evening's talk. Uh, on that note, um, those that have joined us before will know we tend to have a, a midpoint break around halfway through. So that'll be somewhere around half past seven. At that point, uh, it'll be a five minute break. Feel free to go and grab a, a, a mug of tea or your beverage of choice or go to the toilet, whatever it might be. That just gives Stephen an opportunity to rest for a few moments. But it also gives you as an audience the opportunity to ask some questions in the chat box. And I will collate those and we will ask those of Dr. Sartorio at the end of this evening's talk. That will, should hopefully finish around eight o'clock and we'll have around 10 or 15 minutes of question and answer at the end. Um, Dr. Sartorio has very kindly um, pointed out that if we have more of the questions than we can get through tonight, um, please still put them in the chat box. I will be able to send them to her and she'll very kindly give us a written reply that will also appear on our YouTube recording of tonight's session. So with no further ado, I'm going to very quickly introduce Dr. Sartorio. Um, as I've mentioned, she's uh, broadcasting live from Sao Paulo in Brazil this evening. Um, Dr. Sartori Nina completed the PhD thesis uh, at the IMPE, which is the National Institute for Space Research in Brazil between 2015 and 19, where she explored the effect of ionizing radiative feedback on massive star formation and the turbulent structure of molecular clouds. Um, and for those particular amongst us computer modelers, she developed her own Monte Carlo radiation transfer code, which coupled to an MHD grid code to perform a number of uh, RAID hydro simulations. Um, Nina is also a huge advocate for women in STEM and equity amongst all of the scientists in the scientific field and is currently a postdoctoral researcher at Cambridge University studying X-ray feedback at the Cosmic Dawn. And so with no further ado, I'm going to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Dr. Nina Sartori. Over to you, Nina. Thank you so much, Scott, for the wonderful introduction and for the invitation. Um, you know, um, there we go. Perfect. Yeah. Can you can you hear me and can you see the slides okay? Wonderful. Over to you, Nina. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everybody, that's joining tonight. Uh, so today we'll be talking a little bit about uh, dust and the role it plays in the whole of the universe throughout the ages. Now, if you're anything like me before I started in astronomy, whenever you think of dust, you think of something like this. You think of the this light powdery thing that sticks everywhere in your car and in your furniture, and you just wanna get rid of it as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible. But my aim tonight is to try to make you look at dust in a different way, to kind of see it as your friend and to see that it is really, really something we should treasure, that dust is important for the whole of the universe and for us to be here today. Now, in order to find this treasure of dust, we have to go and step back in the, and follow the steps of, the, of astronomers throughout the centuries. Uh, so what we are gonna do now, we are gonna enter on a time machine and we are gonna go about 200 uh, years back uh, and see a guy um, 
see when, when this was started being discovered. And this takes us to uh, William Herschel, which is probably an astronomer you have heard of, uh, one of the most famous British um, German astronomers. And in the end of the 18th century, what Herschel proposed to do is to look at the night sky and he was going to map the whole of the universe, which at the point we thought was only the Milky Way. So whenever somebody says, I'm going to look and count every single star in the sky, and you think that this is ridiculous, well, that's exactly what Herschel proposed to do at those times. And this is kind of the map of the Milky Way that he came with. You can see the sun is still in the center. It was not in the center of the solar system anymore, but it was in the center of the universe. Uh, sorry, the sun, the earth was not the center of the, of the universe, but the sun was. And this is the map he came. And you can see that the galaxy is quite raggedy. And furthermore, there are regions where you can't see any stars. And he started looking at these holes in the sky, these regions where you didn't seem to see any stars shining through. And he said, well, this is the stellar equivalent of having a desert. So he just said, okay, there's a huge uh, holes in heaven and there's simply nothing, there's simply nothing there. It's just a big void. And we actually stuck to this idea for a very, very long time. It took us almost a hundred years after that for somebody to come and start challenging uh, what Herschel had said. And the first person that came and said that maybe something else was happening was Edward Barnard. So Barnard, he said, well, it's not that I think there is nothing there. I think there's too much there. I think there's something in between us and the stars that is blocking this stellar light, right? Um, so basically what we started doing based on this idea by Barnard was trying to look at things from a slightly different angle or should they say at a slightly different wavelength. So light has a number of wavelengths and the visible wavelength, which is the one we were using, Herschel was using to see those clouds, didn't show anything. But if we looked at the same region of the sky in the infrared, suddenly a lot of stars appeared in this previous hole in the sky. Um, so the light that we're seeing here is infrared light. And this cloud or this nebula, as Barnard called it, was just stopping some of the light, but not all of the light, just the visible light from these stars. So I should emphasize that these stars, they are behind the cloud, they are not inside this cloud. And those clouds that, that Barnard observed, he, today we call them Barnard objects, and there are hundreds of them uh, in the night skies of these little clouds. Now, Ironically, the person that discovered this infrared radiation that we observed at this Barnard cloud, clouds that we discovered that there were actually stars there as well, they were just being blocked, the, their light was just being blocked, was William Herschel himself. So William Herschel, he had used a prism to diffract light from the sun, and he actually saw that there was light after the red or an infrared light that he could measure by seeing that the temperature on his thermometers actually increased. So Herschel actually had the means to, if he had a good tel infrared telescope, he would have the means to actually prove himself wrong and see that that was actually not a hole in the sky. Um, okay, so now that we know that we have the souls in the sky and there's something stopping that light, we have to start linking this to dust. And to do that, we have to understand what the dust actually is. So I started this talk talking about the dust that you find in your house and in your car, but that's very different, in fact, from the dust that we find in space. So the dust that we find in space looks a little bit more like this. It's very fluffy and is very small. And you would have think, thought that is very hard for us to get hold of this dust, but gladly we have lots and lots and lots of meteorites and dust grains that fall on Earth every single day. 
So as the Earth goes around its orbit, on its orbit around the Sun, what happens is that it picks up a lot of dust grains that are lying around uh, this path. So about 5,000 tons of dust fall on Earth every single year. That's the equivalent of you having a few dust elephants falling on the Earth every single day. Right, so we were we are able to capture a lot of this dust. Some of it is so small that it actually doesn't fall all the way to to the ground because it burns in the atmosphere as it's falling. But we have sent uh, basically airplanes with very sticky nets that collected this dust and brought them to laboratories where we can look at this dust and see its composition and see how it looks like. I also wanted to emphasize how small this dust is. So here on the left, I have a picture of a human hair zoomed in. And then what we are going to do now is take one of this dust and kind of put it more closer to scale to this human hair. And as you can see, it's tiny compared to it. It's, it's a fraction of the size of a human hair. Right? And even here, I made it slightly bigger than it should, just so that you could look at it. Okay, so this, this dust particles, they're tiny and they're everywhere in space. And they have a very basic formation. So they, the dust itself is usually made of one of two things. Either it's made out of silica, and you can think of that as the sand that you find on the beach. Or it may, is made out of carbon, and then you can think of something like uh, soot, right? Also, because dust is usually found in very cold regions of space, it's usually covered with a small layer of ice. And this can be water ice, so H2O, but it can also be other types of ice, such as uh, carbon monoxide or ammonia ice, okay? Um, so this is how the dust looks like, is little grains of sand and soot in the universe um, that, that are basically covered in this little ice layer, okay? Now, just to give you an idea of how much dust there is in the universe, I think you've probably, if you have attended astronomy talks in the past, you've seen some sort of, uh, some shape of this plot before. So we think that the whole universe is made out of matter and energy, and actually most of it is made out of what we call this dark energy. So this is the energy that we think that makes the universe expand. And then a small amount of it, about 30%, is all the matter that we know in the universe. But even this matter, most of it is made of what we call dark matter. So this is matter that interacts with other matter in terms of gravity, but it doesn't emit light, so we can't see it. We know it's there because of gravity, but we haven't detected or seen what it is yet. And that leaves about 20% of the matter to be this regular matter that makes you and me and stars and galaxies we see in the universe. And most of this regular matter is in what we, in the space in between stars. So is what we call the interstellar medium. And in the interstellar medium, 99% of this interstellar medium is gas. And only 1% is actually dust. So dust is a very, very, very tiny fraction of all the components of the universe. And I want you to bear this in mind throughout the talk. Okay, so now that we know what dust is and how much dust is in the universe, it would be good to understand how we can observe dust and why we want to observe dust. And to understand how we can observe dust, we have to understand how dust interacts with light okay, or electromagnetic radiation. Um, so one of the way, the way that the light and the dust interact depends a lot on the wavelength of the light. So light has different wavelengths that relate to different energies of light. So if you have, for example, blue light, blue light has a smaller wavelength than red light. Now, the dust is really tiny, as we just saw. So if you have really tiny wavelengths, things like blue light, like ultraviolet light, they interact very well with, with dust. So what happens is that this little um, wave, light wave comes, interacts with the dust, and then it can get scattered. So you just basically throw the light in a different direction, or 
it can be absorbed like we saw in the Barnard cloud in the beginning of the, of the talk, all the visible light could get blocked um, by, all the visible light got blocked by this dust in this cloud, okay? Now, if we were looking at the scattered lighting set, so imagine that you have here a little star, the star is emitting light, it finds some dusty cloud and it scatters this light in another direction. So mostly the blue light gets scattered because it's this, the light that has the small wavelengths. So we are able to see things like this. So here at the left hand side, we have the witch head nebula, which hopefully you can see why it is a witch head. It has like this big nose and big chin. And if you like astronomy at all and you know your constellations, this big star here is Rigel, is the knee of, or of the Orion constellation, right? And Rigel is emitting all this light, and this light is passing through the, um, the witch head's nebula and is getting scattered by dust. And that's what is giving this dust this bluish glow. It's not actually the light that comes from the dust itself, is just scattered light from Rigel. And the same thing is true for the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. There is a huge cloud of dust that is passing in front of the Pleiades that is causing dust to get scattered, which causes this bluish glow that you see all around each one of the stars. Okay, so this is what happens to light that has very small wavelengths. What about a light that has really, really big wavelengths? In that case, what happens is that basically your wavelength is so big that it doesn't care that the dust is there at all. So it just passes through, right? So again, if we remember what, uh, what was happening when we were looking at the Barnard's cloud, you remember when we looked at the infrared? Well, infrared are very, very large, um, light wave, light waves with very large wavelengths, so the light can just pass through the cloud and you can see the stars now. So that's what we were seeing at the beginning of the talk when you were seeing suddenly in the infrared all the light from those stars suddenly appear. Okay? Now there is one more very important way of observing light and that is observing the light of dust itself. So dust itself emits light. Everything in the universe that has a temperature, and everything does have a temperature, actually emits light. And the light that uh, does emit because of its cold temperatures is also in the infrared. It's still slightly bigger than the infrared we were talking that was near infrared, but in the far infrared, that is the type of light that dust itself emits. And this is when you can get really cool astronomical pictures because then you can see the glow of light of the dust itself. Okay, so let's, um, let's see some pictures. So for example, in this one, this is the Cigar Nebula. And if you look at the left-hand side picture, you can just, you can see it's kind of a little bit boring, right? You can't see much. You can see like this disk of stars, but that's it. If you turn your, your telescope to actually look in the infrared, then all of this gas that you couldn't see before and all of this dust suddenly appears and starts glowing, right? So as soon as we started looking at the universe in the infrared, we said, wow, we were missing a lot of the picture. We, were, we thought that there were lots of regions of space that like Herschel, we thought were empty, but they were actually just filled with dust, okay? So astronomers were really, really, really interested in just seeing, you know, what can dust tell us, okay? Now, as everything in the universe, whenever we want to see it, it's not a very easy task to actually see those things. And when it comes to infrared uh, and looking at dust, this is complicated partially because of our atmosphere. Now, don't get me wrong, I really like our atmosphere. It protects us from a lot of very harmful radiation that comes from the sun. But if you see here on this plot, the infrared is more or less where I drew this uh, black dashed lines. And a lot of the infrared radiation just gets completely blocked um, by the atmosphere, which makes it very, very hard to observe those things uh, from the earth. On, on the ground. Um, in order to observe them from the Earth, what we have to do is to have basically a really, really, really large telescope. 
usually somewhere that is very far away from any noise and where we are going to have the least clouds and a very good weather all the time. Hopefully somewhere very high up, away from all the annoying people with their cell phones and things like that. Okay, so it, that's that's when we came up with ALMA. So ALMA is the Atacama Large kilo, Millimeter Array. And here what, it, what we have is an interferometer. So basically what you do is you take lots and lots and lots of smaller um, telescopes and you put them all together to behave as a very, very big telescope. So in, in this case, you, we spread those telescopes and they, they behave as a telescope that is basically the size of uh, central London. So it's a ginormous telescope, okay? And this, even though we have very little radiation that gets through in the infrared, ALMA can still detect that just because it's such a big telescope. Now, another solution to detecting infrared is to send things to space. Obviously, there are difficulties in sending anything to space, but in infrared is even more complicated because you remember when I told you that everything that has a temperature in the universe glows? Well, yes, everything that has a temperature in the universe glows, including you, me, your house, and telescopes. And guess in which frequency do they, which wavelength do they emit their light? Yes, just like dust, we emit light in the infrared. So when you are sending these huge telescopes to space, you can't just send them as they are, because otherwise, instead of detecting the infrared from the stars, they would start detecting the infrared from themselves, right? And that's a huge problem. So we have to send those big telescopes with genetic material uh, in order to keep the telescopes cooler so that they emit at a different frequency and then all the infrared we detect is actually from the stars. Right. So we sent over the last 20 years, we sent lots of really cool uh, infrared telescopes such as the Spitzer um, and Herschel. And both Spitzer and Herschel, they were still in pretty good shape. To, they could continue making observations, except that once they ran out of that cooling material, that was it. Even if their all their equipment was still working, they couldn't see anything astronomical anymore. Uh, and those should be really amazing pictures as you're going to see in the rest of the talk. But now our, our new hope is the James Webb Telescope, which if you were following, it was, it was sent here. So this was the Christmas present of every astronomer. Um, and he, this telescope is also going to be observing the universe in the infrared and hopefully answering some of our questions. Um, okay, so I don't, I don't know if you want to take a break now. Thank you, Nini. Yeah, we'll just take a, a five minute break. So for everybody, if you want to go and refill your glasses, um, it's an, an opportune moment or, or avail yourself of the facility, so to speak, we will be back in exactly five minutes. So by my watch, that will be 7.31. So we'll see you in five minutes. Thank you, Nina. Sue's posted the first question. Um, I've just noticed a second coming in there from Alex, so thank you. I've noted those. We will ask those of Dr. Sartori at the end of the talk. But with no further ado, back for part two. Over to you, Nina. Thanks. All right, so we've just seen how dust interacts with light. We've also... Um, now we, we want to see what the dust... Uh, thus as an effect when we are looking at astronomical features of things. So astronomers have to understand dust in order to understand what else is going wrong, uh, go going on in the universe. Um, so this is a picture of our neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy, in, in the visible uh, light. Okay, And what I want you to pay attention is that there are these dark lanes here right, that are blocking a lot of the stellar light. And as you might expect now from the previous slides, yes, this is the same thing that's dust. Okay, so you can look at the same image now with uh, the Herschel telescope in the infrared, and that's what we see. We see this beautiful dust glow, 
right? And we can some, do something even cooler. We can paste one image in, on top of the other, and we can see this composite image. You can see that this uh, this glow of the dust is filling all of those dark um, alleys that we were seeing before. And I want you to stop for a moment and think how amazing this is, because this dust, which forms less than a fraction of a percent of the universe, is managing to block the light of millions and millions and millions of stars. Okay, so if you if you've been lucky enough to to go somewhere on the Earth where you don't have any light pollution, um, you can see big figures like this, like of the Milky Way, and you can see what Herschel was doing when he got all that raggedy map of the Milky Way because he was seeing all this dust and the dust was blocking all this light from many, many, many stars. For you to have an idea, the Milky Way would look about a million times brighter if we didn't have any dust in there. And actually for astronomers, it's good that there is dust because otherwise it would be so bright, so bright that we wouldn't be able to see almost anything. It would be just light everywhere. Okay, so dust is actually our friend. It's not just stopping the information from the stars to reach us, right? Now, what we can also do is try to see how much light comes from the stars themselves and how much of this light is coming from dust or things that dust is taking the starlight and modifying in a different way. So this is one of those plots. So basically here we're taking the whole of the Milky Way and separating the blue curve here is showing everything that we're just seeing from stars. So that's just starlight and the optical light and the ultraviolet light. And the red one here is everything that has been reprocessed or emitted by dust. Okay, so as you can see, dust emits more than all of the other stars. Half of all, more than half of all the, of the light that you can see in the universe is actually recycled by dust. So it's incredibly important to try to understand how dust interacts with other things. Otherwise, we are missing half of the picture. Okay, but dust is not only important because it's changing the starlight, it's also very important because it's part of many processes in the universe that shape who we are. So, for instance, you remember that icy mantle that was around, um, around the dust grains? Well, they are incredibly important because they are like mini factories of elements and molecules. So, all those ices they are able to capture little atoms that are floating in space and a lot of chemistry starts happening in those ices and you can start forming really really simple molecules like um, just molecular hydrogen but you can also make something that almost look like organic uh, molecules that makes you and me so we think that those complex molecules that one day led to the the beginning of life was actually developed first in this little dust brains floating in space right not only that dust is seen always in very 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 dense cold regions of space where we also find something else, we find star formation. So here what we see is the Horsehead Nebula. Again, on the left we have just visible light. On the right here we are looking at in the infrared. Now, unlike when we were looking at the Barnard Cloud, the cloud from the beginning of our talk, these stars that suddenly are appearing here in the second picture, they are actually inside the nebula. They are little stars that are starting to form and they form in this dust cocoon. And the reason that they, they, they like to form where you have all this dust and uh, not only is not only because it's dense, but it's because as a star starts contracting, as the gas starts contracting to form stars, it heats up because it loses all that gravitational potential energy and it transforms it into heat energy. Now, in order, in order to continue contracting, it has to cool down. And the way that it finds to cool down is some molecules like molecular hydrogen, which gas it, they form in the dust grains, or dust grains themselves, they are able to take those UV light, uh, the, the bluer light, the more energetic light, 
and re-radiate them in the infrared and they help the whole gas cloud to cool and to collapse to form stars. So the star formation as we know it today, it's really, really dependent on all this dust that we find around. If we didn't have any dust, we could probably still form stars, but it would be a lot harder. And it's not only stars. If we try to zoom in in some of those star forming regions, what we see is also the beginning of protoplanetary um, disks. So as you can see here, those are all stars that are forming that we observed with Alma. And you can see all this dust glowing. Uh, and you can even see those puffs where you have more dust that is going to develop into lots of little planets with different orbits on the figure here on the on the right hand side. So dust is not only important for the formation of stars, it's important for the formation of planets because planets basically grow through little dust springs kind of sticking together and growing into large and larger rocks until you get something like the earth or you you get something like the core of the gas giants that we see. Um, but also, so, uh, but also of stars and even of molecules for life. So it's really everything that we know of, all the stars, all the planets, all the life. We only have that because we had dust in the universe. Okay. Um, so I think I hope I convinced you that dust is the best thing even before sliced bread was invented. So now, now that we've seen all these interesting things about dust, uh, we want to know where is all this dust coming from? And this is the, the million dollar question, let's say. So from this talk, we know a little bit already what dust needs to form, right? So the first thing we need for dust formation is that we need somewhere in space that has enough gas. Right? If it's a place that is not dense enough, then the chance of you having different atoms starting to stick together to form dust is very, very small, so you're not going to get any dust. So you need something that's dense. It doesn't need to be quite as dense as the Earth's atmosphere, because the Earth's atmosphere for you know, space purposes is really, really dense, but it has to be about at least a few hundred particles per, per cubic centimeter. Okay. Uh, so, provided that we have dense enough regions, the other thing we need is that this region is also fairly cool. So, we are talking here about a few hundred degrees Kelvin. So, it would be less than zero degrees Celsius. It would be really, really cold for us. And why do we need this to be cold? Well, if you start heating up dust, they start gaining kind of energy and they start kind of dancing around and colliding with each other. And that usually is bad news for dust. It, they start crumbling and dismantling. The other thing is that dust is constantly being hit by all sorts of things like cosmic rays and atoms moving at very large speeds and also very energetic photons that can help this dust be destroyed. So Overall, if you have a, a regional space where you have either too many of these very energetic UV photons um, of UV light, or if you have temperatures that are very high, your dust just evaporates and we can't get any of them. And then the other thing we need is time. So whenever, whenever you're trying to form dust, that's not something that happens overnight. It takes hundreds of thousands of years to form just a few dust grains. So it needs to be a place in space where you have the right density, you have the right temperature, and you can give it enough time to form. So with all the astronomers stopped, they thought, well, where can we find this, these conditions that would be good for dust? And they said, well, okay, there is one place where we know that that happens, and that was in red giant stars. So red giant stars, stars there at the end almost of their lifetime. So those, those stars, they, they are stars like the sun. So they're not very massive stars. Uh, and what happens is that the sun today, it works because it's burning hydrogen on its core. And this, this hydrogen burning is balancing the force of gravity. So gravity wants to make the sun basically collapse and contract. 
And the fusion is creating energy kind of pressure that's kind of saying, no, okay, I'm not gonna, gonna allow you to contract, right? But at some point, the sun is gonna run out of hydrogen in the core. And at that point, the sun is gonna start contracting and releasing a lot of energy and the outer layers of the sun are just gonna puff up. And that's gonna create the red giant itself. Um, so these outer layers, when they, they puff up, for the sun, they will become the sun will go become so large that it will engulf the whole of the earth. So we better have found somewhere else to live by then, because otherwise we're gonna be completely swollen by the sun. Now don't worry, this is still gonna take another eight billion years, so it's plenty of time, but the sun is going to really become giants and that's why we, be, we call it a red giant. Now the core of the sun is going to contract, continue contracting until it can start burning helium and then helium is going to burn and then we are also going to run out of helium and at that point you're still going to get burning not really in the core but in shells around the core and that's very 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 unstable. So what happens is that the the stars start sending pulses of material from the from the the core to the outer layers, and this is really good because what happens then is that you are sending all these really nice building elements of dust. So things like the carbons that we were seeing, uh, the silicates, and to these outer regions of the sun that are not very dense, but dense enough to form dust. And because they are so far away from the core, because the core is very hot, but these outer layers actually can cool down to temperatures where dust can actually form. So this is the perfect factory for dust, right? So we have the right building blocks, it's dense enough, it's cold enough, and we were all very, very happy. And then we did what any good astronomer does, we went and we observed it. So here on the on the left hand side, what I'm showing you is the is Betelgeuse. Um, so that's also a red giant. And if you heard of it at all, uh, so that's the shoulder of Orion. So before we were looking at Rigel, which was Orion's knee, and now we are looking at the shoulder of Orion, which is which is Betelgeuse. And we looked at it, and the star itself is actually this thing inside the black region there. But what you can see on the outer layers is that you have this bucket load of dust. So we were all very happy and we were like, yay, we solved it. We went and we saw another, um, so this is the, the, on the right here, C.W. Leonis. And you can see here this really nice, almost like layers of dust that were formed because of this pulsations of the stars that I just talked about, the, the pulses that send the material off, and then whenever you send the material off full of this uh, um, carbon and silicates, this dust was able to form and then we can observe it um, in the infrared. So that was more or less the picture of what we had of dust until the beginning of the 2000s. And we were all very happy and thought we had solved it and there was no problem there. But then what happened is that we got Herschel. And then I took Herschel and we started looking at the, at the night sky. So this is just Herschel looking at a random uh, direction in the sky. And at first sight, this picture is actually quite boring. But let me just tell you what we are looking at here. Every single one of these this bright points is a whole galaxy. And it's not even only a whole galaxy, it's a whole dusty galaxy because we are observing them in the infrared, right? And until then, okay, well, we are just surprised. Well, we didn't think that there was this much dust in the universe. We thought it was a lot less. But okay, we have a lot of dust, that's fine. But then there was a bigger problem. The problem is that many of these galaxies that we are observing in these pictures, they are, they are not in today's universe. They are galaxies that lived hundreds of millions of years ago. They are galaxies from the very, very beginning of the universe, okay? And that poses a problem to our previous theory. Why? Well, 
we started plotting those galaxies from the beginning of the universe. So here we are plotting redshift. Redshift is just a way of saying age. The larger the redshift, the earlier it was in the universe. It was the closest to the Big Bang it was. Okay. And you can see that this kind of has the same correspondence here with the age of the universe. So here at redshift, for example, eight, the universe was just half a billion years old. So for you to have an idea, the universe today is 13.8 billion years old. So those are the first galaxies that we were able to observe. And we were, plot we were plotting here the amount of dust that they have. And look at that. It's huge and huge amounts of dust. They are like 10 to the 9 solar masses of dust. That's equivalent of ha you having a billion suns just made of dust in each one of those galaxies at the very beginning of the universe. And that really, really puzzled us astronomers. Why? Well, we were talking about producing dust on these red giants. However, the sun itself has been around for 4.5 billion years, and it hasn't become a red giant yet. For it to to actually have a red giant anywhere, you need at least 10 billion years or so, which is okay if your universe is 13 billion years old. But if you're trying to see if there were already galaxies with lots of dust just half a billion years after the Big Bang, then we couldn't explain those with those red giants anymore. So we needed something else that produced dust in huge quantities in a very, very small amount of time, right? We, we even tried to, to say, well, what if, if we got things slightly wrong? What if we could have a lot of things evolving to this red, uh, red giants in the early universe? But even then, if you see here this plot, we are plotting the galaxies here, there are the dots, and this purple region is showing how much, you know, this, this the smaller stars, these uh, red giants could actually produce. And they can explain some, even using like very, you know, dubious theories, we could explain some of them, but most of the galaxies that we observed were completely, un completely unexplainable, right? So this red, 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 red giants, they took too long to form and they didn't produce enough anyway. So we, we needed something else. We needed a different um, alternative theory. Okay. Um, and that's when we started thinking of very massive stars instead. Now, you remember when I was talking before that the sun has to balance uh, its, the gravitational pull by fusing in the core. It's the same thing for every, every single star in the universe. So, except that for the very, very big stars, the force of gravity is much, much larger, right? So, which means that those really massive stars, they have to burn a lot quicker the fuel in their core. So, for comparison here, the sun is a, is a G star, and we are talking now about stars like this O stars, which have tens, sometimes even hundreds of solar masses, okay? And so these stars, they burn for their fuel in the core very, very fast, which makes them live a lot less. So for example, a star, here we are plotting different stars of different masses and seeing how long they take. So you see a star like the sun here is gonna take a few billion years to evolve fully. But if you go for a star that's, for example, um, 10 solar masses or even 30 solar masses, then you can get the whole of the evolution just happening in a few hundred thousand years, okay? So this could explain uh, those formation. We just have to find a way of making those very big stars producing, produce dust. Not only that, big stars, they sound like a good idea because we're talking about of the early universe. So when we have the Big Bang, so the Big Bang is happening here, on the left, the Big Bang only produced really two elements, hydrogen and helium, right? And as we were talking earlier, we need this dust to help things cool down and for you to form stars that we see today. Now, because the, the Big Bang didn't form any carbon, any silica, anything like that, there was nothing to help those gas clouds in the early universe to collapse. 
So before they could collapse, they needed to acquire a lot of material so that it would, the gravitational force would just pull everything together and, call, and contract things to densities high enough in the center so that things could just start fusing hydrogen just like in stars today. So what we think happened in the very beginning of the universe when the first stars came about, what we call the cosmic dawn, because it was the first light produced in the universe, um, was that we had stars that were way, way more massive than stars, the stars we see on average today. So some people say we had stars that were even a thousand times the mass of the sun. So overall, it seems like a good idea. Okay, so we already think uh, we have more massive stars in the beginning of the universe, plus more massive stars live very shortly, so they would be able to, to create things in the right time scale. And furthermore, those massive stars are the stars that actually produce all these heavy elements. So every single element like iron um, and things like calcium, things that are in us today, were producing these very massive stars they can't produce in the small ones. So that's when Carl Sagan comes and say, well, we are all stardust, right? Um, so they already had the right building blocks for the dust as well, right? Which small stars wouldn't have. So they had everything going for them. Except that when we look at the stars, these stars are extremely hot. And you remember for dust formation, we needed something that was cool. And the so, so we, we needed to find something that was not the star when it was still alive. So it started turning our eye. Why, why, why if we don't, we don't consider the star during its life, but during its death? So those really big stars, unlike the sun, are going to die in what we call a supernova explosion. So when you have a supernova explosion, just a lot of material gets thrown out into space at a very short period of time. So all the building blocks of dust suddenly get thrown into space, okay? Now, the problem with that is that whenever you have the supernova explosion, it's very, very energetic. It's so bright and so hot that for a very small amount of time, the whole superno the, the supernova is brighter than an entire galaxy, right? So there was a supernova we were going to talk about later that exploded in the Middle Ages in 1054, which created the Crab Nebula. And that, that supernova, because it was close to us, relatively close to the Earth, it was brighter than the sun during daytime for almost a full week. So those are incredibly energetic explosions. So at first sight, they didn't seem like the proper place for you to get this formation. But as the supernova expanded in this kind of shock front, so you had just all this material being ejected, if you gave it enough time, then the gas inside the supernova started to pull. So in the supernova remnant, it started to pull. So we decided to go and check. Maybe, maybe we can form some dust there. So we took Herschel and we, poof, we pointed to the supernova here, which is called Cassiopeia A. And for the surprise of a lot of people, we found dust. And we not only found dust, we found a lot of dust. We found the equivalent of a whole solar mass almost of dust in there, which is quite a lot for a single star to be producing, right? And that got all the astronomers really, really, really excited. We we're like, okay, so we can form uh, dust inside the supernova. But maybe this was a one-off. Maybe, maybe we were just lucky with this Cassiopeia. So we went and we looked at another one. Um, and this one is the 1987A supernova. So this is a supernova that we also saw. It's called 1987A because it was observed in 1987. And in that year, there were two supernovae that we observed. So this is A, there was another one that was B. And again, here we see the same thing. So here we see this kind of outer region here is the X-ray. So that's the shock of the supernova expanding outwards. So this is the really hot bit, right? Uh, you can see a little bit of the shock also in the visible. And then inside this region where the shock has already passed through and you have all these building elements uh, of dust, um, 
the gas was allowed to cool and dust was allowed to form over time, right? And this is crazy because here you already have uh, more than one solar mass of dust forming, right? And this is barely 30 years ago, right? So you can form dust very quickly, very efficiently. This, this is great. Everybody was very happy, um, except that in astronomy, there is always a little but, right? Um, okay, so this, when we looked at this, um, the supernova, and then we started making the models to see if they could explain those very early uh, galaxies, the amount of dust that we produce in those very early galaxies, we, at first sight, we had wonderful news, right? So you can see here, this yellow region here is now what we can predict with supernova creation, according to what we saw in those supernova there. And we can explain basically all observations about the space spectrum. So yay, except not all the dust that is produced there in the supernova survives. We think that actually a lot of this dust gets destructed. Okay, why do we think this dust gets destructed? Well. Whenever a supernova explodes, you have this shock front that is traveling that I was talking to you about. But when this shock front finds the cold interstellar medium, it creates another shock that travels in the opposite direction. It's more or less as if you imagine that you were like with a snow plow and you are taking dust away. If enough dust accumulates, then some of the dust is gonna start falling falling back on the person that is driving the snowplow, right? So you have this kind of backward shock wave. And when this backward shock wave travels, it can destroy, it can heat up this dust again and destroy most of this dust that formated inside the supernova shock. So we have models for that. And that's what uh, theorists have been telling us for a very long time, is that, yes, the at first sight, the supernova are fantastic. It can produce all these really nice uh, dust grains of many different types of elements. But as soon as you have this reverse shock, most of those, more than 90% of those get destroyed. And we are left with basically almost no dust, right? And we realized the problem there because both of these supernova that I just showed where we found lots of dust, they are very recent supernova. One is from 1987, the other one is from the 1700s. So the, in this supernova, the, this reverse shock hasn't passed through yet. You can even see this reverse shock. So this is the same supernova I was showing you before, uh, Cassiopeia A. And you can see that there is a blue region and then there's a red region. And then I drew the kind of reverse shock here in green. So this reverse shock is gonna move in and you can see that the, the region where the reverse shock has already passed through doesn't have much of a dusty glow, right? If you look here at the infrared, all the dust that we are seeing is, is still inside of this region where the, the reverse has, shock hasn't passed through. So we're like, okay, we can't say the supernova create this creates enough dust unless we observe a supernova where the dust shock has already passed through, okay? And that's when we decided to take our telescope and look at the Crab Nebula or at that supernova that we know that went off in the Middle Ages because that's already a thousand years old, so you definitely should have gotten this reverse shock through most of what was the supernova remnant. And Yes, we did see dust, but we saw very little dust. We saw a lot less dust than we saw in this other two supernova uh, uh, I was talking about. So that really confirmed our fear that this reverse shock is kind of destroying um, most of what we were left. And then if we go back to this plot again, after the destruction of the reverse shock, we would get back to this black line, which if you see, it's almost the same thing that we would get if we had those small stars producing dust in this red giant phase, right? So basically we went back to the beginning. We're still stuck with the same problem that neither this uh, red giant seem to be able to explain all this dust that we find in early galaxies, nor the supernova, unless we got something wrong in our modeling. 
So actually, we astronomers were still pretty confused where this dust comes from. It's still a mystery we we're trying we we're trying to solve, right? Maybe we're gonna improve our modeling of supernovae and suddenly they're gonna be able to create enough dust and maybe our observations we just didn't observe enough supernovae yet to see how much dust is actually produced. Or maybe the universe is somehow much older than we think it is and red giants were able to produce dust, who knows? Or maybe we are going to find a completely different answer that doesn't depend on either supernovae or red giants and you can invite me in a talk in 10 years time and maybe I'll be able to give you some more of an answer. So we really have to basically just gather more observations and now with the James Webb Space Telescope we have entire programs just dedicated into looking a, a, on lots of supernova to try to answer this question and then keep improving uh, our modeling of, of, of all those explosions and the stars and everything and see how dust actually gets produced and, and, and destroyed. Okay, and that's, that's it from me. Thank everybody for attending and let's thank the dust that made us made it possible for us all to be here today thank you fabulous and again if you were at keel tonight i'm sure there'll be a rapturous round of applause but i'll give you my own anyway so you can hear that at your end um we do have a few questions and actually it, it ties in very nicely with a couple of the topics that you just mentioned um you obviously mentioned the james webb space telescope and i just want to reiterate uh, we've got sophie allen coming to give us a talk a month today on exactly that subject which i think will be a wonderful follow-up um but the first question which was very similar um, <clears throat> to some of the things you mentioned at the end of your talk there, Nina. Um, and Alex has very kindly asked, it, asked this, which is, are there some areas of, uh, you know, in galaxies or parts of the universe or nebula where it's intrinsically more dusty than others? So are there, I guess it's a bit like my daughter's bedroom, really. Are there some corners of the universe where it's a little more dusty than others? And if so, why might that be? Yes, yeah, so the, the answer is yes. Yeah. So most of the dust is concentrated on what we call molecular clouds. So those are the regions where, for example, we have star formation. And the reason we have more dust there is just because those are the regions that, as I said, they are cold and they have densities high enough so that dust can actually form. Now, whenever you go, for example, if you have a very massive star that is emitting lots and lots of ultraviolet ultraviolet radiation, then the, the light that comes from the stars just starts breaking up the dust and destroying the dust. So there are some regions of the universe where, for example, we have lots and lots of very massive stars that are more dust free, let's say. And whenever you see, for example, a massive star forming, you can see that it starts making a little hole on the dust, as if you will. it looks, it starts looking a little bit like, um, so, I can kind of show this one. This is not trying to illustrate that, but it's a similar concept. So here, if you have a star, the stars kind of start making those holes, it, like a Swiss cheese where none of the dust can exist. So you have this dust-free regions and then you have the dust around on the other parts of this molecular clouds. Fantastic. I hope that answered your question, Alex. It certainly did for me. Um, Douglas, I'm going to come to your question, which was the first one posed this evening. Um, and so bear with me, I'm going to read it out as it's written, uh, Nina. Um, Douglas says he read the Times today, so obviously hot off the press. I don't know if that's in print or online, but he says that a meteorite hunter has made a lot of money searching for fragments of meteorites in Gloucestershire uh, and then selling them on. Typically, these were only a few milligrams. Are these particles the same composition as your intergalactic dust? Um, well, yes. So, for example, when we started, when we still didn't have fancy ways of collecting dust from outer space or from the outer layers of the atmosphere, what we had to rely on were, were those really obvious meteorites, right? So if we just go back to the beginning here, so the meteorite I'm showing here, this is the Alenda meteorite, it's from a collision that happened in Mexico. And you can see that every single little bit of this meteorite has little dust grains. And we know that these dust grains come from space because we basically know more or less the average composition of, of our solar system. 
And we can look at the sun and we can see, well, what's the average composition of, uh, of everything? Um, and we can see how we can, we can measure basically the depletion of different elements. So you can see how many elements are lacking. So we can see, for example, if there is carbon lacking, if there, if there is uh, silicon lacking, and all these elements that are usually lacking, they are locked up into dust grains. So we can look at the composition of those grains and compare it with the composition of our sun. And we can say, okay, those things must have come from outer space because they wouldn't be explained on the earth. So basically what we take, what we will try to do is we take these rocks and we put them in basically a lot of acid to try to unglue all these little dust grains and then we can analyze them. But to find small meteorites is quite, you know, challenging and something like about a few centimeters is really, really, really hard. So whenever somebody finds one, usually they are pretty valuable. If you have something large enough, it, it can carry quite a lot of information. I hope that. Very nicely, actually. So we're kind of working our way back from the surface of the earth a little bit further out. Uh, Peter's very kindly asked, um, at what altitude does the dust collecting aircraft operate in order to collect sufficient dust particles for analysis? I think there were a few different efforts that went on different um, layers of the atmosphere, but I think most of them went on the stratosphere and just collected dust there. Basically, the idea is that, okay, so if you ever seen a shooting star, what a shooting star basically is, is a little dust grain that is falling through the atmosphere. And the reason you see a shooting star is because it heats up so much that it starts emitting light that you can see. Um, now, because it, it heats up so much, it also evaporates. So those things don't, don't hit the Earth's surface. So we just really want to get those things before they start burning, before they get to the point that they are so hot that they are just going to disappear. So as long as you're like in the stratosphere or so, you can already collect those quite well. Yeah, makes total sense, Nina. Uh, Manas is very kindly asked, um, how can we see uh, things beyond the dust clouds in space? So he, he says, without sending a satellite f further out than the dust cloud. So I guess really, how do we adapt our optics on Earth to, to view those uh, objects through the dust clouds, if that makes sense, Nina? Yeah, so again, the, the that's what I was trying to explain with the very long wavelengths lights. So light has a bunch of different wavelengths. So things like red light, they have a larger wavelength. So things like in the infrared and in radio, they don't tend to interact with dust as much, right? Uh, so you can imagine that if you imagine that the wavelength is kind of how, how much this, this light is kind of oscillating in space. If the size of the oscillation is about the size of the dust grain, it becomes very hard for you to just ignore the dust grain. But if your oscillation is maybe the size of your cloud or much, you know, much bigger than the dust grain, then those oscillations can just kind of completely ignore the dust cloud and, and just shine through. So whenever we want to see through a dust cloud, we, we need to be observing basically in anything that has a wavelength, a light that has a wavelength that's longer than your average dust grain size. So things like infrared or radio astronomy is where you're going you're gonna to get those things. Fabulous. Um, um, thank you, everybody, for continuing to post questions. We've got three more. I'm wary of time, so I'm going to try and get through all of them, if that's OK with you, Nina. Um, the first one is from Mohammed, and thank you again, Mohammed, for sending this in. Uh, he's, he's wrote, uh, when you mentioned the different compositions of dust, uh, would it be right to think that the composition of this dust affects the elements which it then seeds into the solar system uh, that can have on them? So he's put, uh, is it right to think that the composition of dust affects the elements which plants in a solar system can have on them? So I guess he's talking about this very specifically, um, the biology of certain, uh, you know, certain planets almost within a solar system, is that affected by the composition of the dust that potentially is falling on them? Yeah, 
absolutely. I mean, if you if you look at, at the earth, you look if you look at rocks on the earth, we have a lot of silicon, a lot of iron, which is a lot of thing. It looks a lot like the dust that we find in space in lots of ways. I mean, we think that planets like the earth were just made by basically getting a huge amount of dust and kind of mushing it together so that uh, dust can basically stick to each other, right? So if you see dust like this, because it's very amorphous in shape, when two of them collide, they, they tend to stick together and, and start forming slightly bigger particles. Now, this is still also a little bit of a mystery. So yes, the, the composition of the dust is very much going to dictate, for example, the composition of, of planets, and especially planet cores. Um, but there's a whole branch of astronomy and geology that's trying to figure out how you go from actually just having dust for you to actually having a whole planet because it's a huge different size difference right and we try to do this in the lab but we always we always have this problem that we can grow dust up to like maybe a few millimeters uh, and then after that the, the dust just very annoyingly stops sticking together and then we can't get anything bigger than that so that's just still kind of a little bit of a mystery as well on, on how the dust actually gets to the point that it can have something as big as the earth or as big as a rocky planet. That's really that's really interesting. Thank you, uh, Nina. Right then, on to a question from Hamza. Uh, Hamza's put, why couldn't the dust seen from near the beginning of the universe be from parts of the supernova before the reverse shock wave? Um, and we are and are we able to see it even though the dust clouds it only existed for a short time, if that makes sense? Okay, so the reason is that those, so if you go back to, to the reverse shock, so the reverse shocks, they take, let's say, a long, more than 30 years for it to go back, but they're still a lot quicker than, than the age of the universe. So they are going to take a few thousand years. Whereas we are the, the galaxies that we are seeing full of dust, those were galaxies that, you know, are around for over 10 billion years. So we know for sure that we already had time for both the shock of all the supernova to kind of, you know, go out and then the reverse shock to com come in and destroy all the dust that you need to, to destroy. Okay, so the, the number of supernovae would have a, that you would be observing that is happening at that point in time. If you sum, those are not as many as all the supernova that you had until then. So we really need something that already had produced a lot of dust and kind of spread it around the, the spacing between stars because that's the dust that we are actually observing. Thank you, Nina. Yeah, and forgive me, I did say the final three, three questions ago. Um, I'm terrible for this, but I will stick to the final two questions. And thank you, Will, uh, aged 14, for a, and I'll come to your question last. But Alex, for the penultimate question, and, and this is quite interesting, is asked, he understands that the dust isn't evenly distributed at a subgalactic or cosmological scale, um, but at a galactic scale, are some galaxies significantly more dusty than others? Yes, there are some galaxies that uh, we see that, um, that are more dusty. Uh, and usually that it has to do, to do with how much star formation we got in the galaxy. So we still don't know exactly how dust forms, but we are very convinced that it has to do with stars themselves. Because we can measure how, how much stars a particular galaxy has formed during its history. And those galaxies that formed more stars also have a lot more dust. Um, so we were even slightly worried when we were looking at this very dust galaxies that we were trying, we were getting a very biased sample of galaxies. Because when we look back, obviously the further you look into the universe, the, the you know, the earlier of the universe you want to see, you need to see those really, really bright objects, right? So it, those objects are biased on their own right. So those early galaxies is only the very brightest early galaxies that we're, observe, we're, we're observing. Uh, so a, a bunch of people just said, well, it's not that the, the galaxies at the beginning of the universe are all dusty. It's just we're observing this kind of, 
not normal galaxies, not average galaxies. But then we had a little problem that in like, um, so I think I have an extra slide actually with that. Okay, yeah. So in, two, in 2015, we actually observed a galaxy that it was a normal galaxy that was also from the beginning of the universe. And the way that we did that is this galaxy was very conveniently located so that it actually got uh, gravitational lens its light. So basically, gravity distorted its light so that we could see it nine, nine times brighter than we would see it normally. So this is kind of one of those galaxies that is not very big, it's just like a, your average Milky Way galaxy, but in the very beginning of the universe. And, um, and, and, and this kind of, kind of set the, the, the question to, to, an, to, to an end, like, yes, the, this one also had a lot of dust. So all, we think that all the galaxies in the early universe were actually uh, very dusty. We don't think that we have uh, a bias anymore on this early universe. And since this one was discovered, we discovered another couple that were also very dusty and were more normal galaxies. So we really think the, the universe was, was dusty. Thank you, Nina. That's really interesting. Um, I'm going to hand the final question to Will. I am wary of time. Uh, so Will, who's 14, so thank you for tuning in, Will. Uh, that's great. Uh, he asks, uh, how much dust have we ever collected? I've got this vision that someone somewhere has got a big dust pan and brush and a bag. Um, how much have we collected? And do, or do we keep a record of it, I guess, would be a good question. Uh, we definitely do have collected, like, I think very confidently at least a few tons of dust that is like distributed around, you know, universities and research facilities all over the globe. So every, every like geology department, astronomy department tries to have quite a big sample of different dust and, you know, different meteorites and things like that so that you can study, especially for planetology. I think it's very, as I was saying before, it's very important to, to have, uh, Oh, this does. I wouldn't be able to give you an, an accurate figure because, I, yep. But yes, we do have quite a lot of dust. We're no short of, of dust in, in universes. Thank you ever so much, Nina, and, and thank you everybody that's been watching and tuning in. It's it's been a fabulous talk. I certainly learned a great deal this evening. I'm sure all our listeners uh, have done so the same. Just as a reminder, thank you very much Nina, for giving the talk. Uh, for those that aren't on our mailing list, please do sign up. Um, if you drop a message in the chat box afterwards, I can give you the link. But just as a reminder, um, our next talk is a month today. Um, it's on the subject, as I mentioned earlier, of the James Webb Space Telescope. The talk is entitled The Ultimate Universe Detective and is being given by Sophie Allen of the National Space Academy. That's on the 24th of March. So thank you everybody for this evening. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. I look forward to seeing you all again in a month's time. Thank you very much again, Nina. Good night, right. everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation. Goodbye. Goodbye.